When the scribes and Pharisees asked our Lord about the greatest commandment, he replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So why do we hear some of today's most prominent pastors saying things like this? It had everything to do with how we talk about the Bible. And specifically, or along with that, what we point to as the foundation of faith, which for most Christians, unfortunately, is the Bible. We need to do better. We need to love God with all our hearts and stand unashamedly on the rock of His Word. We need to love the Lord with all of our souls and respond to the worldview issues of our day with the wisdom and discernment that comes only from Him. We need to love the Lord with our minds and understand the calling of God's people in every area of life in God's world. We need to love the Lord our God with all our strength and face the work of building a life-giving, God-honoring culture. Join us for four days at the Cultural Leadership Academy as we consider how the gospel influences all of life and culture and the role that we have to play in applying foundational Christian thinking to every area of life. non rock a boat -us must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. The, yeah, I love you, Jeff. Delusional, yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Yes! Oh my God! What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. This is the Gospel Heard Around the World, everybody. Very important show today. A very, very important show today. We are going to talk about Trump's statements on abortion. We're going to talk about the Arizona Supreme Court ruling that uh, very old law that was never removed from the books during the duration of Roe versus Wade. It has been a thing the whole way through. Upheld in Arizona and all kinds of... Um, mischaracterizations right now about Arizona, calling it a near abortion ban. Whet your appetite a little bit here. Uh, there is uh, no abortion ban in Arizona for women. Um, as a result, and all thanks to Kathy Herod, Center for Arizona Policy, and pro-life legislators, uh, women are free in Arizona, again, uh, courtesy of the pro-life establishment, uh, to DIY abortions. Uh, they have immunity and impunity in the state of Arizona. However, we're going to talk about that Arizona law uh, that uh, is, is pointed to and upheld. Hey, it was there the whole time, and it's valid. It's a valid law. Hasn't been removed from the books. We're going to talk about turncoat charlatan frauds uh like Ooh. carrie lake Ooh. and uh and yeah and so we're gonna talk about those things today and if we get a chance uh, to engage a bit with a few comments uh made by our friend douglas wilson from christ church moscow idaho um still unfortunately hasn't seen the main issue and so we want to engage a bit with that because we hope that our our friends and our our, our family 
over there in Moscow yeah. would uh, would get consistent on this issue. Um, there's some blind spots, and uh, I know they think we have them too. And uh, and but this one is uh, is a demonstrable blind spot. And uh, so I hope Doug uh, I hope Doug uh, gets gets corrected on this uh, because he would be a big help in this area of uh, justice and the abolition of abortion. And so we're going to try to handle all that and just get right into it today, everybody. I'll just say quickly, apologiastudios.com. That's where you go to get more, all the episodes from all of the broadcasts, whether it's Provoked, Sheologians, Cultish, or Apologia Radio. They're all there at apologiastudios.com. Also, don't forget to sign up for your free, completely free, Bonson U account at apologiastudios.com. Seminary-level education, the best instruction and teaching you can get uh, from Dr. Greg Bonson, one of our heroes of the faith. Uh, greatest Christian philosopher, and I believe, in the history of the Christian church. And so all we have is entire life's work there for you for free. If you are not, uh, if you don't have an account, you're not listening to it, you're, you are truly missing out. And uh, don't forget to sign up for all access. When you do, you make everything we're doing possible uh, across the board, whether it's the abortion mill ministry, even f- helping to fund some of the end abortion now stuff, uh, to the on the street evangelism, to the theological lectures and sermons, whatever the case may be. If it's coming from Apologia Studios, it is coming to you courtesy of ministry partners who have signed up for all access and uh, partner with us in this ministry, make everything we do possible, and you get all kinds of additional stuff. Next week, Ken Gentry's flying in to do the uh, Apology Academy on the Book of Revelation. We're about to dry, drop Eli Ayala's um, uh, next part of his series on Christian apologetics and the defense of the Christian faith. Very excited about that. All that's at apologiastudios.com. Welcome back, everybody. Very important moment for us in the history of our nation. Uh, we are uh, very... Uh, uh, thankful to God for the moment that we're in. It is difficult because there is a lot of compromise, a <laughs> lot of inconsistencies, and uh, coming from a lot of people that it shouldn't be coming from. Uh, but we are thankful to God that uh, He's allowing this moment to come into everybody's view, and so the fight uh, is is happening, and we're thankful for that and being able to have a prophetic voice in the midst of it. And so that's Luke the Bear. Hi. I'm Jeff. It's they call been me, an eventful week. They Sorry. call me the ninja. It's okay. No, it has been. Your phone's been ringing off the hook. Oh, it's been crazy. Yep. On the phone with legislators, uh, on the phone dealing with compromise, trying to encourage legislators to do the courageous thing, stand on the word of God, uh, don't compromise, uh, acknowledge the lordship and authority of Christ, and uh, yeah, difficult difficult phone calls this week, difficult moments, and uh, difficult things in terms of seeing people that should know better say things that they shouldn't. And we're going to get into it today. And so let's just pop right into it. So uh, let's start with Donald Trump's statement. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, this week, what day was that, Luke? Was that Monday? Was <laughs> it Monday? It, it, yeah. This I week is so. blending yeah. together. It's funny. My wife had to tell me that it was Wednesday. She, I was like, Yesterday. Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> yesterday. Hopefully not today. No, no. I thought it was like, I, was, I seriously thought I was like, it was Tuesday. And she was like, dude, no. No. Um, so um, yeah, this speech set off a whole load of dominoes this week. <laughs> Just look, keep falling. It's and and look, hey, th- let's be honest. This is this is where we all get tested in moments like this. Do you do you favor the truth or do you favor a person? Are are you yeah. are you a fan of the truth? Are you committed to the truth or are you just committed to a personality? Um, you know, when we talk about showing partiality and personal favoritism, what you're doing is you're regarding the face of somebody. In other words, you're, you have a favorite face. And that, according to scripture, is sinful, uh, right? Like in terms of truth and justice and righteousness, God's word defines that. And so one of the rules in scripture is to show no partiality. Uh, partiality is a sin in God's word. Partiality is an abomination in God's word. God specifically refers to unequal weights and measures as an abomination. Partiality is a sin. We don't want to have as Christians favorite faces, right? We let justice slip away. We ignore truth. We disregard the truth. We ignore evidences against our favorite person because we're regarding the face. And so this is where that gets gets tested, right, Pastor Luke? That's right. You can have you can love things about Donald Trump. No one's saying that you can't love that uh, he was a help in many areas. No one's saying that. No one's saying that uh, you know you you can't be thankful uh, from an inconsistent man because he's an inconsistent man. You can't be thankful for the good things. No, you can, you can. But in moments like this, where your favorite face face plants, as a Christian, your duty is to acknowledge it and simply say, yeah. 
that's a face plant, that's wrong, that's immoral, and I have to confront that. Favorite faces? Sin. Stop regarding the face of another person. God calls us to uphold justice, uphold his standards of righteousness. And when our favorite face is doing something that is against the will of God and God's word, we have to be willing to confront our favorite face. That's righteousness. That's truth. That's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples. He's got these disciples. They love him. He loves them. And in the midst of the, the gospels, you can see as he is walking with them and fellowshipping with them and, and discipling them and caring for them, there are moments in the gospels where he confronts them. Now you would say, well, like this is his, these are his people. He hand selected them, right? He chose them and they come follow him. He calls them by name and they follow him. These are his people. Like these, this is how God has planned this. And yet you see in the perfect image of God, that's who Jesus is. He's the God man, the incarnate one. You see in the perfect image of God, what righteousness and justice looks like, even in a close relationship. You can love each other and still confront something that is wrong. And Jesus shows us that he confronts Peter. He confronts the other apostles and and disciples for their sin or inconsistencies. And they didn't think he hated them. But when they were doing something wrong or saying something wrong, he would speak to them. He would confront it. Okay, so let's be like Jesus. You've got a favorite, Donald Trump. Who wants Biden to win? No Christian wants Biden to win. No one wants that. No one wants to see this uh, this country just completely get annihilated in the next two and a half years. No one wants that. And so everyone goes, well, you know, Trump did some good things. I want Trump. Great. Okay. Fantastic. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak prophetically against the things that Trump is doing that are inconsistent, because all of that, all that is, is just pure and undefiled idolatry. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. If your favorite face is sinning against God and saying things that are inconsistent with the Christian worldview, it is idolatry to, to, to not confront it and to say, well, you know, I'll just pretend like he didn't say it. And, you know, he's my hero. He's my savior. Some of the, like I said, you guys have heard me talk about before, some of the grossest things I've ever seen in my entire life that turned my stomach was uh, the day of the Capitol breach. Um, we were there to film and uh, just film the whole thing and, and talk about it from a Christian perspective. And uh, I just, the, the signs were so gross, so, so gross. Signs of like uh, Trump kind of on a cross kind of a thing. And, you know, Trump wrapped up like a little baby with Jesus and, you know, uh, and uh, it, it, it's just, it's this, this messianic kind of complex yeah, yeah. surrounding Trump. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say before we get into this, this is in no way about voting for Trump or nope. not voting for Trump nope. because I know people are people are going to be upset with us because we didn't say you should vote for Trump and then you're going to have people upset with us to say that we shouldn't vote for Trump. This has nothing to do with that. This is strictly having to do with the speech that he made this week about abortion. That's it. That's it. Don't show partiality. Let's engage a bit with his comments. Healthy American families. We want to make it easier for mothers and families to have babies not harder. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. Like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious baby. What could be more beautiful or better than that? Okay, so let's start laying on that foundation right there. So precious, what's more beautiful than that? We talk about IVF and the creation of human life. He wants to make sure that it's available to people and Christians, of course, um, are, are somewhat not, I don't think they're quite divided on this in terms of if you, if you get down to the nitty gritty of this, it, it, the, where there's division in the issue of IVF would be in the area of if you say that you value human life and that human life deserves to be protected, that it's sacred, that it's a beautiful thing to create human life. If you say that, then your industry has to act like it's true. In other words, don't say that you're for the creation and preservation of human life in the IVF industry. If you are willing to create human life willy-nilly and then just destroy it. So when I say Christians are divided on this and the issue of IVF, I think that's the main point. That's the main, main point. There are other issues, but that's the main point is that we would say, look, if your industry says creating human life is important and preserving human life is important, then you have to act like that's true 
And it wouldn't be wrong to place restrictions around I- the IVF industry to say you cannot just create human life and destroy it. Right. That's a consistent position. You can hold both positions there. Okay. There are other issues that should be talked about. I acknowledge that. But I think that's what's being ignored here. And if you don't know what Trump is really referring to, he's referring to the recent events that took place in the state of Alabama with the controversy surrounding IVF and uh, Alabama courts and, and the legislature. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. It's just to say Trump wants to say that creating a human baby is a beautiful thing. What's more beautiful than that? The question that has to be asked of President Trump is very simply, when does that human life begin? When does it begin? Now, I think, and I'm, I'm confident about this, that President Trump would say human life begins at fertilization. That's why we're talking about IVF. It's a beautiful, precious baby. What's more beautiful than that? That's the point. And so if we say uh, abolitionists and the pro-life industry says, they both say, uh, that human life begins at fertilization because that is a biblical fact, an in, in indisputable b- biblical fact, and it's an indisputable biological fact. And so if the pro-life establishment and industry and the abolitionists are all saying human life begins at fertilization, that is where we need to begin this conversation. And I want to say that is where former President Donald Trump falls completely onto his face here, and he promotes immorality. He shows that he's inconsistent, and that's unfortunate because I don't want former President Trump to be inconsistent. Um, I'd like to see him corrected in this area. He did hold to a more consistent position when he adopted the pro-life position until he had his hand smacked by the pro-life establishment, and we're going to show you that as well. But that's the key issue here. Everyone, grab hold of it. It is vital. It's where this whole thing rests. If human life begins at fertilization, is that if that is where there is a unique human being created at that moment, then that is where we need to begin defending human life. That's where justice must be established, and we need to do away with the inconsistencies and the compromise that has only led us to more death. It is precisely this methodology of pragmatism over against principle that has led to... How many now? I don't know. How many? 70 million plus babies dead since Roe versus Wade. And we keep thinking, well, you know, if we don't use God's word and we just compromise and we focus on pragmatism, that eventually maybe one day we can, we can end the bloodshed. Have you noticed something? Uh, it's not doing that. Have you noticed something that you can't change the heart of people with lying to them? You can't lie to people. You can't hide the truth and expect, expect people to receive the truth. Right? Just think about it in terms of the gospel. How are you going to get somebody to turn to Christ and to recognize their own sin if you downplay the, their sin? If you right. downplay their sin, if you downplay the holiness of God, how are you going to get someone to trust in Jesus and not just have a, a false profession of faith about evangelism, downplaying personal sin and its consequences and downplaying the holiness of God? The only way you get people, some people, someone to actually repent and believe the gospel is through the power of the gospel with the Holy Spirit, with the word of God and with the truth. You're not going to get your nation to, to turn away from, bloods, uh, from, from uh, uh, the bloodshed and child sacrifice if you keep lying to them about the nature of what they're doing and so th- i'll ahead. just say quickly like just i don't want to miss this point that <laughs> this is literally a narrative before even alabama before what happened in alabama with the ivf stuff this is a narrative that the pro-life industry started in response to our equal protection bills yeah they're the they're, they started coming out saying well you're saying no ivf and parents are trying to have babies and blah blah and we're like whoa time out We've had Bradley Pierce on here talking about it, the man who's written these bills. He in the bills it says you can't do anything unethically, meaning you can't create twenty five lives, use one, and then throw away the other twenty four, or put them on ice. Yeah, that's yeah. what we're saying. And so this is a narrative started by the pro life industry, um, and this is why we still have baby murder. That's right. Here we go. Today, I'm pleased that the Alabama legislature has acted very quickly and pass legislation that preserves the availability of IVF in Alabama. They really did a great and fast job. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers, father, their beautiful babies, and that's what we are. Really? That's kind of the main point here. (laughs) 
That's kind of the main point. We should be on the side of the miracle of human life. The question is, when does that begin? Does it begin when you have a heartbeat? Does it begin when you can feel pain? Does it begin when you have all your digits and they're all fully formed? Like when, when is this miracle of life to be acknowledged? Now, if you're consistent and you believe, as you say you do, that human life begins at fertilization, then that's when the miracle of human life needs to be protected. And that's where justice must be established. There's no way out of this. Brothers and sisters, friends, there's no way out of this. There's, there's, there's no way to, to hold to his position and to be consistent or to hold to the pro-life establishment's position and to be consistent, to fight uh, legislatively with injustice, to say, well, you can kill these kids, but not these kids. And, uh, you know, uh, as long as you can find a heartbeat, uh, then, you know, uh, if you find a heartbeat, then you can't kill them. But you, if you can't find a heartbeat, you can kill them. It's, I, okay, so human life is determined by a working heart now. That's our position, or is it the, the position that you say you believe when you go into churches to do fundraisers, that you believe human life begins at fertilization and God forms us and this is together in a mother's womb. See, the, the inconsistencies abound here and look, justice has fallen in the streets, right? Because uh, it's, it is, it's not there because people will not speak the truth in the streets, in the public square. We withhold the truth, we compromise, we minimize. And so that's why we're, 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 where we are at at this moment is because we won't simply speak the truth in the public square. We think compromise is the way. We think pragmatism is the way. And that's ultimately how Trump ends here in this video is it's, it's about votes. Yeah, It's about pragmatism. That's exactly what I was gonna say. This is literally just political pandering. And um, we saw in the 22 election, the midterms, that abortion was a very hot topic. Um, the left was using some unbelievably egregious videos to try to um, sway people to vote for them on this very topic. Um, and so what we're seeing is all these legislators that are, are literally just afraid of not getting reelected. Um, and that's really all that it's about. That's the key issue. And we've, I mean, almost every state we've worked in this year... I shouldn't say that. There's been several states this year that we've worked in where we had legislators who agree with us on equal protection, wanted to do bills, but literally didn't because they want to get reelected. And they, the theme has been not this year. We can't this year. We, you know, and it's it's like it's, um, it's, it's funny. unbelievable. It's funny every year. That's what they said since 2015. Yeah. Well, yeah. not yet, not yet, not yet, yeah. not yet. And uh, God commands us, by the way, not to delay justice. Exactly. And so, if we obey God's word, we won't delay justice. We'll do the courageous thing. BF is an important part of that, and our great Republican Party will always be with you in your quest for the ultimate joy in life. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights, especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, <laughs> wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. All right, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Look, I'm thankful for a lot of things that Trump has done, but this is a gross exaggeration. All legal scholars on both sides. Oh. No, that's that's just not true. That's I mean, maybe, he's, you know, I'd like to just give him some grace and say he's trying to be hyperbolic, but he's not. Um, it's a gross mischaracterization of the situation. It, all legal scholars on both sides did not want to see Roe go away. Um, well, and, and we're, we're thankful that he. Obviously, very thankful he appointed those judges, but yeah. to say that he's the man, then it's like, come on, well, bro. And, like, and at the same time, can we look again? This is the issue of you know, try to be consistent. All of us have to try to be consistent. I want to try to be more consistent. I know I have inconsistencies. We, I'm not. I'm putting it on the table, saying we're all inconsistent. We need to have our minds renewed and, and shaped. Um, but let's let's be careful. Let's be really careful. We we paid for an amicus brief uh, to be put into the Dobbs case with uh, constitutional attorney uh, Bradley Pierce. So we were all for Roe versus Wade being overturned. Yeah. Uh, I would ch- I would encourage you to read the the brief that Bradley Pierce wrote uh, and uh, and see that that was a consistent one. That went into the case. So we we're all for Roe going away. Okay, great. However, let's let's be careful with our praise of of the Dobbs case and Roe versus Wade going away. And let's be careful about talking about extolling the Supreme Court judges uh, for their courage and bravery and all the rest, because I, I want to say that on the last day, God's going to condemn the decision of those judges. Now, not that Roe versus Wade went away, but condemn the judges for simply washing their hands like Pilate um, uh, and saying, we'll leave it up to the states to decide if they want to kill these kids. That's not righteous. 
Yeah. That's not righteous. Like a righteous judge will judge righteously and in truth. And what should have taken place was a, a testifying against the evil and the immorality of the issue of abortion and putting it to death um, as, as a court and not simply washing your hands of it and saying, well, the states, you guys decide if you want to murder these children. That's, that's, not a, that's not a righteous decision by Supreme Court justices. Are we glad that it's out of the way? Yes, we were arguing forever that it's the Congress that creates law in our nation. That's how our constitutional republic works. Congress creates law, not the Supreme Court. And we were arguing that if any court uh, has a decree a decision that is unrighteous and unjust and immoral and evil, according to God's own standards, then it is up to the lesser magistrate, wherever they are found, to resist the decision of a court that is unrighteous and unjust and untrue. You have a duty before God to do that, just like, as we always say, in the Dred Scott case, uh, where the Supreme Court gave a vicious and evil evil decision uh, with regard to slaves and uh, as property. And we thank God for northern states that said to the Supreme Court, no, we're not listening to you. That's an evil decision. And no. And so we were arguing the whole way through. Ignore Roe versus Wade. It's not a law. It's a court decision. And you have a duty to to ignore it. But uh, let's just be very careful, very careful of offering such high, high praise uh, to the decision in Dobbs, because I want to say that, and I think, I, th- I don't think this can be disputed. If you put that decision before God and said, is this consistent? Is this righteous? Is this good to tell them to give it to the states, to wash the hands, give it to the states, to let them decide if they want to kill children? Do we really want to say as Christians that God is pleased with that decision? That's something that honors and glorifies God? <laughs> no. No. So let's be very careful with our praise of, of the Dobbs case and the Supreme Court judges and all the rest. Are we glad it's gone? Yes. Yeah. I'm glad that God strikes straight blows with crooked sticks. Right? Glad, glad that he does that. He's sovereign, and in his providence, he does. But let's be real careful about our praise of that. Well, I'll tread very, very carefully here, but there are things about SCOTUS and that decision that we're just, we can't say, <laughs> that one day will be revealed yeah. um, that uh, would make you have a very different opinion. Yeah, your blood would boil if you, if you knew what we know and what we experienced um, with reference to the Supreme Court, uh, but we can't yeah. talk about that And I publicly. hate saying stuff like that, but... It just it's hard to sit here and hear stuff like that when you know the truth. So. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. And maybe one day it's going to come yeah. out. Yeah. O. V. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The con- Why? Why is that radical? Uh, let's press this. Let's ask the question. Why is it radical up to nine months and even the suggestion i think it was in maryland uh not very long ago suggesting up to 20 days after birth birth. why is that radical who is defining that as radical okay so let's start to think through okay so it's radical to say execute the child after they exit the magical birth canal that's crazy that's radical all right why Well, because it's human life and it's born. Okay, so because it exited the birth canal, it now is valuable and should be protected. Uh, By the way, uh, really important here, and please don't miss this. If you you don't miss anything out of this episode, don't miss this because this is indisputable and it is the cause of so much death in our nation. The pro-choicers and the pro-life establishment hold fundamentally to the very same position with regard to justice for the human being. Here's how they hold to the same position. The pro-choice movement says when that baby exits the birth canal, okay, let's say 99% of the pro-choice movement, (laughs) except for the people who say, yeah, kill them after birth. Okay, so, okay, there's people that believe that. But the pro-choice movement says that the woman has the right to take the life of her child in her womb willfully, and she must be protected by law to do it with immunity and impunity, that is to say, no punishment. However, the pro-choice movement, largely 
would say that when that baby exits the birth canal and that baby is here, then justice begins for that baby. And if the woman kills the child willfully or participates somehow in its death, then she has to face justice for what she's done. Mm -hmm. So get that. Mm -hmm. Pro-choicers say in the womb, impunity, immunity. But when it's out, justice for the child. Guess who else holds to that position? The pro-life movement, the pro-life industry believes exactly the same thing. That's how they legislate. They want a woman to have the legal right and protection to take the life of her child willfully in the womb with no consequence, no punishment, and with immunity. They literally write it into their legislation. That is a provable fact. It cannot be disputed. It has been attested to by over 70 of the largest pro-life organizations in the nation when they tried to kill our bill in Louisiana. They wrote that letter saying they do not want a woman to ever incur any punishment for taking the life of her child in the womb. But they do believe, the pro-life establishment, that when that baby exits the birth canal, when it's out, then justice begins for the child. Brothers and sisters, the pro-choicers, and the pro-life establishment hold to the same fundamental position on the woman's right to take the life of her child in her womb with no punishment and legal immunity. That is a fact. It cannot be disputed. They are on record. They said it with their mouths. They put it in writing. They write it in legislation. That is a fact. The pro-life movement and the pro-choicers, same position. Same position in terms of justice for the baby. And President Trump, says this is radical kill the child outside the womb all right well when do we what do we do we push it back a little further okay what is it now is it okay they haven't exited the uh magical birth canal yet uh where that somehow when they pass through that they just get all kinds of rights and privileges when they pass through that so is it is it like the somewhere in the ninth month is that radical or eighth month seventh what makes it radical in the seventh what makes it radical in the sixth or the fifth like what is the definition of human life and when is it worthy of protection? And see, this is a question that these compromisers and these frauds can't ultimately answer. They can't answer it. They, they want to hold between two positions. On the one side, they want to say, human life begins at fertilization. All life is sacred. You must protect all human life. Granted, okay, great. I, I want to believe that. That's consistent with God's word. Biological science says it's human life from fertilization. Fantastic. But then they want to argue on the other side that, well, we need to have provisions for, like, for what? Like, what do you mean provisions? Like, well, you know, if there's incest, uh, you know, the baby through no fault of its own um, is the product of incest, we need to execute the baby. Okay, that's interesting. I thought human life was valuable. All of it was sacred. All of it was worthy of protection. I, I thought that's what your argument was. Oh, yeah. Also, we would want to say rape. Okay, rape. Uh, so what did the child have to do with the rape? It's, right. a, it's a distinct human being. So we shouldn't execute the father, the, the, the man who commits the rape. We should execute the children. What other place in our legal system do we execute children for the crimes of their fathers? So you're arguing that we should create two victims. The woman is already a victim. Let's make another victim to solve the problem. So we got one victim, make another victim. I want to say a righteous society would say protect women, uphold their value and dignity, and go with full force and wrath and justice against rapists. Rape should be punished, punished by death in our country. People should, should, should view rape as such an atrocity and such an abomination like God's word does, that we stop letting people rape people and then hang out in jail for 10 years, then, then get freed to do it again. If you rape somebody, that is something that cannot be paid back. You cannot make that right. It's like taking somebody's life in scripture. You've done something where nothing can be repaid. And so that's why it's worthy of death. And yet we're arguing here as pro-lifers that we should allow for the execution of a child and create a second victim. Why don't we argue consistently? Why don't we simply say, uh, no, let's create a culture and create a legal system that simply says, you rape, you die. That's it. Why don't we actually solve the problem that way, establish justice against rapists, and surround women and babies in this situation of rape? I've got friends that are the products of rape. 
and I thank God for them. Mm. And I'm glad they weren't killed and executed. But that's what's being argued is, is by these people is that, well, you know, it's radical over here, but we need to have some exceptions over here. Well, I thought it was human life. I thought it was all sacred. I thought all worthy of protection. Well, you know, not really. Um, well, what do we do? Like, you know, when, when is it not radical? Well, let's, let's say uh, pain capable. Maybe if they're capable of pain, uh, then we don't do it. Okay, so my ability to, to feel pain is what makes me human. Interesting. So that's what gives me my value and dignity. Oh, I thought it was human life is what gives me value and dignity. Image bearer of God. And then the whole thing of like heartbeat bills. It's, it's such partiality. It is such unequal weights and measures. It is astonishing to me that we are, we are so not educated in the word of God, the law word of God and the wisdom of God. We are so not educated in it. We so don't understand it. We so don't want to understand it that we just let these inconsistencies go. And we wonder why this is still taking place. We wonder why it's still taking place. But it's just, I got more to say, but <laughs> okay, I want to, yeah. Except of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. Execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. Is it execution when there's right. rape? Is it execution right. when there's incest? Is it execution at heartbeat right. or at pain capable? Is it execution then? These are questions that can't be answered consistently, coherently. They can't be answered from that side. It's an inconsistent position. And this is what you get, brothers and sisters, with a Christless conservatism. You want all the fruit of the Christian worldview without the root of the Christian worldview. You want all the blessings that God can give and a beautiful world that God can give and things like justice and righteousness and truth and beauty. You want all those things, but you don't want it with Jesus. You don't want to stand on his word. And this is precisely the case is that you want the blessings of the Christian worldview without the Lord of that Christian worldview. Well, this is, this is the point I wanted to make was, I was waiting until we got that part, but, um, you know, at the beginning, you start saying that, you know, what's more precious than these beautiful babies, you know, but if it's conceived in incest, that's an ugly baby. We should kill it. Or if it's or conceived right. in rape, that's an ugly baby. We should kill it. You know, I never thought about this till just now. Where does incest come from? Who says that we can, who says that's bad? Mm-hmm. Right. Why is that a problem? Wait, yeah. That, guess what? That's God's law. So you're going to accept that that law, but then you're going to punish the 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 parents who broke the law. I mean, you're going to punish the baby for the for for the parents who broke the God's law. Yeah. Like I, I never thought about that. Just now, that's mind boggling. Yeah, I grew up with I grew up with friends. Yeah. I grew up with friends that were the products of incest. They were my friends, and uh, I'm super glad that they weren't killed. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, we are so inconsistent in this. Baby is born. The baby is executed after birth. Is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. Is it unacceptable to execute after birth? Okay. Is it unacceptable to execute at two weeks gestation? Why not? Why is that unacceptable? Do you see the inconsistencies? You can't argue that it begins at fertilization. Human life is valuable there and should be protected. You can't argue that and then say, but in these instances, you can kill them. It's inconsistent. It won't work. It's compromised. And that's why we've been losing. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others. And that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or in many Oof. cases. All right. Now, I made the argument, I made the argument that this is going to test us as Christians. Are we showing partiality? Do we, are we actually, do we have some idolatry in us, in our hearts? Where we'll, we, are, we are willing to regard the face of our favorite person and show partiality and ignore the truth. Donald Trump just said that we need to follow the will of the people and follow our hearts. Okay. Here's the problem. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. Is that something we want to promote in the Christian worldview? Follow your heart? Follow your heart. You know, there's lots of people today following their hearts. They feel deeply, deeply in their hearts that in my heart, and I believe God is for this, 
I'm not really a boy. I'm a girl. In my heart, sexuality can be done this way. Uh, I can live the furry, uh, orgy lifestyle. I can uh, have polyam polyamorous relationship. I can engage in um, polygamy. And in my heart, I feel it's true. I mean, I've prayed about it. I, I believe with all my heart it's true. You know, there were people during the time of slavery that with all their heart believed that it was right and good to enslave our black brothers and sisters. There were people during the time of the Holocaust that believed with their hearts that it was right to treat these Jewish people in this way. You know, when you allow human beings who are fallen to follow their heart, there are going to be consequences, incomprehensible consequences. No, the Christian worldview does not teach people to follow their hearts. Jesus says, sanctify them by their truth. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. God's word is the truth. We're to be set apart by God's word. We're supposed to stand on the purity of God's own revelation. Don't follow your heart. It will lead you astray. The heart is a disciple of, uh, of all things. And he says, he says also, he says, it should be up to the will of the people. Yeah, gonna... Brothers and sisters, that's a dangerous <clears throat> game. It's a dangerous game to play in history. Dangerous game. Uh, follow the will of the people. How many instances do we need to demonstrate from history in the last 200 years that oftentimes when the will of the people is not comporting with the will of God in his holy word, the will of the people leads to tyranny and death. Again, two classic examples need to keep being brought up in this conversation, slavery and the Holocaust. The will of the people can sometimes destroy neighbor because what people tend to do uh, in certain societies, they tend to draw a circle around their group of people and say, well, we're larger and more powerful than your group of people. And so it is our will that you're under our boot. It's our will that you're enslaved. It's our will that you die. And so when you tell fallen people, follow the will of the people. No, that's not consistent with the Christian worldview. It's the will of God that's supreme. What is God's will? in this. And I pray to God for the leader one day that stands in this position of power that says the real question is, is what does God say? What does God say about this? Well, there's a man, there's a lot right there in that, <laughs> that statement. One, it's really sad that uh, someone who already served a term as president doesn't understand that we're a constitutional republic and not a true democracy. Um, he Le just said Lex Rex is the principle. Exactly. Yeah. It's not follow the people. It's not Demas. We're not a true democracy. It's Lex Rex. The law is king. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately our forefathers, I don't, they didn't say in the constitution, they didn't define life from conception. Cause I think everyone just assumed that it's Christian worldview. <laughs> it was just assumed, yeah. but that's, you know, right now we're reaping the, that because they didn't write it out. But, um, you know, we, we we would agree this is a state issue, and I, you know, if, if if Biden tried, I mean, they've tried this. The liberals have tried to make gay mirage a thing from the top, from the federal government. It doesn't work because it's a state issue. It's the same thing. Like we would agree it should go to the states, but the law, Lex Rex, the law is king. Um, we're not going to follow the will of the people. We're going to abide to the law. Which guess what? Our laws were based on the English common law, which is based upon god's law that's right so yeah anyways that's that was the other thing at the end of that will of the people yeah. dangerous game to play your religion or your faith do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself do what's right for your children Oof. do what's right for our country and vote so important to vote at the end of the day it's all about will of the people that's where we are right now and that's what we want the will of the people no, no. Let me give you a scenario just to think about how bad this is. It's about the will of the people. Let's imagine that as we are on this fast track to depravity in terms of the family, in terms of fatherhood, in terms of sexual ethics, the track that we're on right now, um, you know, the... Uh, the glory of only fans, you know, <laughs> sexual immorality, just rampant and right in front of us constantly. Let's imagine that we stay on this track and our nation isn't brought to repentance and faith in Jesus. And let's imagine that we are 25 years into the distant, into the future. Okay. And we've been on this fast track and it just continues to spiral down and out of control. We're mutilating children, uh, cutting off their genitals and their breasts. We are, um, 
uh, promoting immorality, the destruction of the family, injustice, and all the rest. We're 25 years in the future. And now, let's do this. The vast majority of Christians in the nation are now silenced and um, in the caves, right? We don't have a voice. We're not speaking against it. And the overwhelming majority, the will of the people, believes all of these things that are unbiblical and unrighteous and unjust, right? They, 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 they glory in sexual immorality, the destruction of human life, the destruction of the family. Now, take this statement and ask yourself, would I support it? 25 years from now with a society that is seeped in depravity and the will of the people is more depravity. Does that kind of statement work 25 years from now on this fast track that we're on? Would any of us support 25 years from now after a full tailspin into depravity, the will of the people as supreme? Wouldn't we always say as Christians, like we've done throughout Christian history, that it is the will of God that people have to yield to, right? That is a Christian ethic. It is not the will of the people. It is the will of God. God has spoken. He's given a prescriptive will. He's given his standards. He's given his law. And that is what Christians are supposed to stand on, not the will of the people on especially an issue like this that has to do with the most innocent lives among us. It's a dangerous game to play. I want to thank the six justices, Chief Justice John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Neil Gorsuch, incredible people, for having the courage to allow this long-term, hard-fought battle to finally end. This 50-year battle over Roe v. Wade took it out of the federal hands and brought it into the hearts, minds, and vote of the people in each state. It was really something. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. You must follow your heart on this issue, but remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, to save our country, which is currently, and very sadly, a nation in decline. It's a nation in decline because it's following the will of the people, not the will of God. Also, again, rape, incest, life of the mother, less than 2% in all the statistics of abortion annually, less than 2% are for rape, incest, life of the mother. That's been across the board. It's been consistent, rape, incest, life of the mother. And so that's not really, these are the talking points of the pro-choicers. These are the talking points of the pro-choicers in the mouths of the supposed pro-lifers, the four lifers. And so rape, incest, life of the mother, again, it's simple. Um, uh, incest, we're going to kill the children uh, because a uh, brother or sister got together or cousins got together. Uh, why is the child being punished? Because they broke the law or because they sinned. Rape, no, let's not create another victim. You're not solving the problem of someone being a victim by creating a second victim. Let's go after the rapists. Let's create legislation that makes people horrified and terrified of ever committing rape. Let's put rapists to death. Let's stop putting children to death because of rapists. And then when it comes to life of the mother, it's an interesting thing because when it comes to the statistics of abortion, that issue is such an infinitesimally small uh, number of actual abortions that are taking place. And in that case, it's not an abortion at will. You're not taking the life of a child at will saying, oh, it's inconvenient to me. It's in my way. I don't want this. Uh, No, that's a life-saving operation where actually the principle that's being applied there in the life of the mother is the principle of the preservation of human life. Isn't it interesting? It's not about just the execution of human life. It's the principle of preservation of human life. And what tends to take place when the life of the mother is truly at risk is the doctor is doing his best to preserve both lives. And in a fallen world, sometimes you cannot preserve both lives. And so what do you do? You try to save one because human life is valuable and you want to preserve human life. And so that's a rescue operation. That is not an abortion at will. And it gets thrown into this conversation and now it gets it's coming out of the mouths of the pro-life establishment. Rape, incest, life of the mother is the pro-choicers talking point and now it's being accepted here and if you heard that last thing what did you hear what did you hear that the real issue here on the tail of this right what's what's there what's really lurking in the background the real issue is abortion people are discovering is not an issue that wins elections 
Uh, it's an issue that people are divided on. And so what you want to do is you want to get away from a more firm or consistent position. Find yourself somewhere in the middle there with human life and so you can still win elections. And so really the issue here is not the life issue. The issue here is the mm -hmm. winning issue. Mm -hmm. The vote issue is the real issue here. So underneath all of this is we've got to win elections, guys. Right? We've got to be willing to do away with principle. We've got to be willing to do away, oh, do away with the will of God. And we've got to win elections. And so the real issue here, Republican pro-life legislators and pro-life voters, is that please, goodness gracious, we've got to win the next election. So please, can you compromise on this issue of life? That's exactly right. He said that last statement. It was, you need to do the right thing. But, and there's a huge but, we need to win elections. That's the issue. Our nation needs help. It needs unity. It needs us all to work closely together. Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, everyone. We have to work together. We have to bring our nation back from the brink. And that's where it is. It's at the brink. And we will. We will do it. I promise you, we will do it. Always go by your heart. But we must win. We have to win. We are a failing nation, but we can be a failing nation no longer. We will make our nation great. We will make our nation greater than ever before. Thank you very much. Follow your heart, but be willing to compromise yeah. because I have to win this election. We, we need to win this election. So follow your heart. But don't let it get in the way of the votes. That's the real issue here. That is the real issue here. Brothers and sisters, we've seen it with legislators. We've sat in rooms with legislators. And that's always the issue. How do we win these elections? It's not the issue of what's right, what's true. What does God say? It's how do we win this election? How do we win this election? That's going to get away in the way of winning the election. We can't do that. We can't do the justice thing now. We'll do it later after this election. And every time it's the same. Every year it's the same thing. It's like, well, next year. Next year. We're going to win this election. We just can't let this happen this year. We're going to win the election. Next year you come back and they say, ah, you know, you know we've got some problems in some districts. Next year. We can't do this issue now. We'll do it next year. It's always next year. They always want to withhold justice for these preborn children because they've got to win elections. No. Nothing's changed. Nothing is new under the sun. I'm wondering when the hero is going to rise up. Mm -hmm. Where's the hero? Where's the hero who's going to rise up? Where's the person who's going to stand consistently and say, I'm going to do what's right before God. Right. We're going to follow the will of God here and not our fallen hearts. We're going to follow God's will. We're going to do what pleases God. We're going to glorify him. And that's, by the way, when justice will no longer stumble in the streets and truth in the streets, when it's brought into the public square, mm -hmm. as Isaiah 59, 14 says. But interestingly, watch this. I want to show everyone this. You've probably seen this before. Uh, this was Donald Trump before the 2016 election. Donald Trump, of course, we were leery of. I'm thankful for a lot of the things Donald Trump yeah. did. Uh, and we all are. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump, uh, we were leery of because I grew up with Donald Trump on TV. And everything. You, know, you know who he was, like cozying up to liberals. And he's this, you know you know, billionaire, uh, businessman, it's Donald Trump, you know, and he's, he's, a, he's a liberal and now he's conservative. Now he's pro-life. And so he adopts the pro-life position. And I want you to watch, please watch this and consider the disparity between pre 2016. I'm now pro-life Donald Trump and now pro-life Donald Trump trying to win an election. Okay. And if what I'm saying to you right now bothers you and irritates you, because I'm critiquing this, you might have a little idolatry in you. You might have a, per a little bit of personal favoritism in you because I'm not saying anything right now as a Christian that you should disagree with. Here is two different Donald Trumps, two different pro-life Donald Trumps. Here is the Donald Trump when he adopted the pro-life position and he was thinking about consistency. What should the law be on abortion? Well, I, I, I have been pro-life. I know. What should I've the law? I know your principal. That's a good value. But well, you know, what should be the law? This presidential election is going to be very important because when you say what's the law, nobody knows what the law is going to be. It depends on who gets elected because somebody's going to appoint conservative judges and somebody's going to appoint liberal judges depending on who wins. I've so, never understood the pro-life position. Well, I never understood you know, because I understand the principle. Understand. It's human life as people see it. But Which what it crime? Is. What, well, what crime is it? Well, it's human life. No, should the woman be punished for having an abortion? Uh, look, uh, I. He's asking all the right questions. Yeah. Hey, there's give give the guy enough respect to say, hey, he's trying to say, all right, you're saying it's valuable, you're saying it's a crime. 
what kind of crime is it? Tell me what tell me what we're dealing with here. It's it's you're saying it's human life. We got to protect human life. That's a good principle. But what is she guilty of? Now, the Christian should answer this very simply. Murder. Murder. She's willfully and unjustifiably taking the life of her own child. So this is murder. When you take the life of a human being in an unjustified manner, willfully, that is murder. And so it should be easy enough for us to say it's murder. Now, of course, people at the top of the pro-life industry, the pro-life establishment, don't like to use that word because they're wholly inconsistent. But here, listen to more from the pre-2016 pro-life Donald Trump say that it's a very serious problem and it's a problem that we have to decide on uh is it's very hard. You're I mean, are you going to say well wait are you going to say put them in jail are you, is that well no what i'm asking you about? because you say you want to ban it what's I, that I mean would, i am against i am pro-life yes what is ban, how do you ban abortion how do you actually do it well you know you'll go back to a a position like they had where people will perhaps go to illegal places yeah but you have to ban it do you believe no, in but, but do you believe in punishment for abortion yes or no is a principle uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. Ten no, cents, ten years, I don't what? Know. That I don't know. That well, why I don't not? Know. I don't you know. You take positions and everything else. I Frankly, I do take positions and everything else. It's a very complicated position. Hey, I'm asking, this. you're running no, for no. president, I'm not. Chris, I'm asking you, Chris, what should a woman face no, no, if she chooses I, I to have I'm an abortion? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play that game. You, game? You, have, you, you said you're pro-life. You have, I am pro-life. That means banning abortion. And so is the Catholic Church pro-life. So, that's uh, pre-2016. Uh, it might even have been 2016. Uh, Donald Trump, pro-life Donald Trump. You can see where his eyes went up? Hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll be consistent here. There must be some, some form of punishment, right? Because if I'm saying it's human life, yeah. and she's taking it willfully, and it's unjustified taking of human life, then it must be some form of punishment. But he, 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 you could tell it was the first time he was really working through that, like live. Right. There must be some form of punishment. How did, how did that end? How did that end? I'll tell you how it ended. It was when the pro-life establishment came in and smacked Donald Trump's hand and said, no, 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 no. That's actually not our position. We don't actually believe in equal protection for all humans from fertilization. That's not really our position. We, we say that we do, uh, but we don't really believe that. We actually want the woman to be able to do it with immunity uh, and uh, that legal protection to do it and with impunity, never any consequence. That is the position of the pro-life establishment. It is a fact. It is not a controversy. It is something they actually boast in. They want women to be able to do it with immunity and impunity. That's the fatal flaw in the pro-life establishment's position. That is the position that is not Christian. That is their doctrine. It is part of their creed. That's what they believe. And so what happened was, is Donald Trump here was trying to be consistent with the pro-life position. Uh, respect to him for doing that. And then he had his hand smacked by the establishment. And they said, no, no, we're not actually looking for equal protection. We don't really want that. We don't ever want a woman punished in any way uh, for such a thing. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. Um, and um, so when you talk about the issue of equal protection and women who willfully take the lives of their children, we have so many examples across the country where we've worked with legislators and other pastors and Christians across the country with bills of equal protection and abolition. So many examples of the pro-life establishment and pro-life leaders being the leading voices of opposition against equal protection. And uh, it's, this is going to intersect right now with the issue of what happened uh, this week at the Arizona Supreme Court. But before we get to it, we've got to tell you about some things. Uh, you, I don't know if you can kind of see it through my shirt right now. Uh, I, and I, Luke has his on right now, too. This is the Ion Layer Patch. Uh, encourage everybody, if you're interested in investing in your health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, to just do some basic research on the benefits of NAD benefits of NAD it'll it'll really blow your mind uh, it's going to it's it's really going to encourage you in terms of wow you know I can I can work on my physical well-being and take care of my body with this really special uh, chemical that God has in our system uh, they call it the the nickname for NAD is the fountain of youth you have an abundance of it when you are young as you get to like 50 years old the numbers can drop to like in half 50 and so this is used throughout your body in almost every major process NAD and so uh 
NAD IVs are very expensive and they're very painful. Not just the, the needle in the arm, but the process of getting NAD into your system is very difficult. And so there is a, co a company named Ion Layer, uh, ionlayer.com, uh, that has created a medical patch with the ability to get NAD into your system throughout the day uh, without any pain. And it is awesome. Some awesome, and so if you go to ionlayer.com and you want to get started and just do some investment in your physical well-being and your health, uh, you type in Apologia in all caps into the coupon code, you get a big discount. And Ion Layer, Ion Layer helps us out um, yep. as a ministry blesses us so that we can keep the lights on and keep the ministry going. And so ionlayer.com is where you guys go. Do you want me to do another one? Yeah, do do the other one. Let's, uh, go, let's, let's get them out do... of the way so everyone sees what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's. Uh... Since we're talking about uh, following God's law and, and not the will of the people, you should check out uh, heritagedefense.org if you want uh, correct sphere government over your own family, over your children. If you homeschool, you should be signed up with them. Um, it's really reasonable. You can go to heritagedefense.org and uh, put apology in the coupon code. Get, get your first month free, and they're an amazing partner with us and uh again that's bradley pierce the same guy who's writing all those awesome equal protection bills and then of course uh go to amtacblades.com this is the trainer axe right here so you can mess around with this and not cut your hand off it's pretty dope um you go to amtacblades.com again apology of the coupon code uh get five percent off and then he also will partner with another five percent um to end abortion now all right, here we go, everyone. So we've been telling you that the pro-life establishment holds to the same position as the pro-choice establishment, that justice begins for the human being when it exits the magical birth canal. Uh, the pro-life establishment does not want equal protection and justice for the child in the womb because they would never want the mother to see any form of penalty or punishment for taking the life of her child willfully in the womb. Again, the pro-life establishment and the pro-choice establishment hold to the same fundamental position on justice for the child. It is only when they exit the magical birth canal. It is the same position. The pro-choicers want immunity and impunity for women to have abortions, and the pro-lifers want it as well. I hope that is a shocking revelation to you. It cannot be disputed. That is a fact. I can show you their own, with their own signature and with their own mouths. That is precisely what the pro-life establishment believes, and I hope that they are brought to repentance uh, for, for thinking through that consequence or the consequences of that position. Now, so an example of this, in this is getting right to the Arizona Supreme Court issue. What yeah. happened this week? Well, the Arizona Supreme Court decided uh, that the pre-Roe law, it's been on the books. The Literally whole, a territorial law. Before Arizona was even a state. That's exactly right. This law has been on the books in Arizona. Only there is something you need to know. Here's the truth. There was another law that was also associated with this law and right with it. There was Arizona Statute 13-3603 and Arizona Statute 13-3604. 3603 criminalized the abortion doctor, the abortionist. 3603 criminalized that aspect of abortion. 3604 criminalized the mother for engaging in the issue of abortion. Now, these laws were on the books in Arizona through the duration of Roe versus Wade. Do you know who taught me that these books were on uh, that these laws were on the books? Kathy Herod the head of Center for Arizona Policy in the state of Arizona. She is one of the pro-life darlings in the state of Arizona. Kathy used to love us. We had a great relationship with Kathy. She had been on Apologia Radio early on when she learned about our position of abortion, on abortion, that it was murder, and we were trying to abolish it. She immediately separated, and in a phone call with me, she said, I could never call abortion murder or say that these women are guilty of murder because I have too many sisters in Christ who have done it. Uh, that was her position, and she she actually began to be the greatest opposition in the state of Arizona against our bills of abolition and equal protection. Let me tell you what happened. Kathy Herod told me about those two laws that were still on the books. She's the one that told me. So what she ended up doing is we put a bill into Arizona, into the legislature, 
with Walt Blackman, mm-hmm. and that was a bill of equal protection and abolition. It said to ignore Roe versus Wade and give equal protection to every human being from fertilization in the state of Arizona. She publicly came out and spoke out against our bill. She said she could never, ever support legislation that would lead to the punishment of mothers for killing their children in their womb because she said both baby and mother are equally victims. Isn't that sweet? It isn't true, however, right? There's only one victim in abortion there, and it certainly isn't the mother who willfully takes the life of her child in her womb. She's not a victim. Is there ever an instance where a woman is truly a victim in the issue of uh, abortion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are limited circumstances where the woman is a victim. For example, sex trafficking, when she is being coerced into having an abortion and she doesn't want to. She's a victim there. And we should go after, go after the coercer mm-hmm. in that case. However, this blanket statement that mother and baby are um, both victims you haven't spent a lot of time outside of an abortion mill. Yeah, never if seen her. If you've made that, if you make that statement, because these women brag, many of them, as they're going in to kill their children willfully. However, what Kathy Herod did in Arizona is she talked to legislators in Arizona out of, and there were many, many that wanted to pass it. She talked to legislators out of passing a bill of equal protection that would have abolished abortion in Arizona, and she had them pass her bill instead. And this is an old family issues fact sheet from years ago. And I want you to take a look at it. So she told the legislators, if you're looking at the screen right now, she told the legislators to not pass our bill of equal protection and abolition. And she said, pass mine, SB 1457. And here's some of what her bill said prohibits abortions on the basis of genetic abnormality such as Down syndrome, right here. Now, I told Kathy that that is irrelevant. It's irrelevant because the bill says you can't have an abortion on the basis of genetic abnormality such as Down syndrome. And all a mother has to do with this legislation is simply announce I'm not killing my baby because it has Down syndrome. I love Down syndrome. I think they're beautiful. (laughs) No, no, I'm killing my baby because I hate it and I want it dead. I told Kathy that. She had no response to it. She can't respond to it. This law is irrelevant. A mother can simply say, I want my baby dead. I don't care that it has Down syndrome. The doctor goes, thanks for that. There's my cue. Next, it says, um, uh, the calls for... Here we go. Okay, I can barely read that because the red's around it. Calls for the burial or cremation of aborted human remains. Oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Right? Don't pass the bill that would equally protect all human beings. No. Pass a bill that says that you've got to give that precious baby a burial. Give it the dignity of a burial. Now, what's interesting about this... (laughs) Is that not only is it twisted, completely twisted to say you can kill your baby, but just you got to at least give it a, the dignity of a burial. I mean, please do at least that. Not only is that twisted and inconsistent, but it also further lined the pockets of the abortion industry. Because what do they do? They pack the costs of all this stuff into the abortion, which raises the, it raises the amount in the coffers. Mm-hmm. And so all it did was help. All it did was add funding. And so finally... Here's what you need to see. Ready? Take a look. Take a look. Because this has everything to do with the Arizona Supreme Court's decision here. Watch this. In red there, repeals pre-row law punishing women who get abortions. There it is. So, this week, the Arizona Supreme Court upheld this pre-existing law that said that the abortionist was guilty of a crime and he had to serve time for it. But what most people don't know, and here's the truth is that it was Kathy Herod who decriminalized abortion for mothers in the state of Arizona, mothers who willfully take the lives of their children in their womb. Kathy Herod, the pro-life establishment, decriminalized for women. Mm -hmm. And so watch when everybody is saying right now that this is a near total abortion ban in the state of Arizona. Not true. It is not true. It is a near total abortion ban for the abortionist But courtesy of Kathy Herod, Center for Arizona Policy and the Pro-Life Establishment's Doctrine, 
Women are free in the state of Arizona, completely free to DIY abortions through yep. pills or potions. You or are a free, hanger if they want. Or in anything you'd like. You can take the life of your child, but please do it within the comfort of your own home and uh, without consequence. And the reason that is true, here's the truth about the Supreme Court's ruling. It is not a near abor- total abortion ban because... They have been given permission by the pro-life establishment to kill their children themselves in the state of Arizona because actually what would have happened this, this week, ready? This is what would have happened this week. What would have happened if Kathy Herod hadn't decriminalized abortion is the Arizona Supreme Court would have had two laws in front of them that they were examining. AZ 13-3603 and AZ 13-3604, one criminalizing the abortionist, two criminalizing the mother who willfully engages in the issue of abortion. You would have had two laws that would have been upheld. Right now, we're only talking about one, and it's just the abortion doctor and all of that, again, given to you as a courtesy from the pro-life establishment because of their non-Christian position. That's the truth. And um, this week, the... Arizona Supreme Court ruled that that law is a thing. Yeah. Praise <laughs> the God. That's it's, huge. It's still there. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there's consistency there. The law is still there. Um, no one's done any legislation to do away with this. And so what you need to know, here's the truth, because we've been on the phone, uh, is that, are you ready? Who is it that right now is trying to overturn the Supreme Court's ruling via legislation? Who is it? Well, you would say naturally, naturally. Well, I imagine like, you know, Planned Parenthood and I, I, I imagine all the, the regular offenders and the liberals and the leftists and the Democrats, they're all, they're all trying to overturn that and create legislation that would do away with that legislation and establish abortion uh, as, as a right in Arizona, which you may be surprised to hear what we know from the inside is it is Republican Mm. pro-life legislators that are working to undo the law that criminalized abortionists. That's where we're at. That is where we are at. It almost happened yesterday. It almost happened yesterday. The le- Go ahead. That was to say, the, le- the level of compromise is far greater than what we thought it was. It's been revealed this week. And actually, I was just thinking about it. This even goes back to before before Dobbs, before Roe was overturned, remember they tried to they tried to do a fifteen week ban and trying to get in and they may have even voted in right before Roe was overturned. Remember that here mm-hmm, in Arizona? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so like this whole court decision has been we've been waiting to see how they would play that out and they're saying, No, 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 the law was the going back to the territorial law, like um and so they've been trying to trying to soften this for since 20 well when you were what year was that now i can't even remember 2022 yeah right? 22 yeah 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 uh yeah so it just yeah the, the what's happened the last two days here in arizona the, literally the arizona gop is just completely falling apart it seems and we're just standing here watching it going oh my goodness they desperately want to win the next election they want to win yeah. votes and so you have pro-life republican legislators hear me on this that are working behind the scenes right now to create legislation to do away with the law criminalizing abortionists. Can you believe it? And and it should be added, this is an emergency law. The the time to put in bills is far past. It was it's, like two it's months over. ago. It's over. The like, session's over. Yeah, it, and they're literally holding emergency sessions in order to try to, to, to change this. Uh, yeah. It's mind-boggling. It's pro-life, Republican, yeah. GOP, legislators. Get this who are trying to undo the law criminalizing abortion doctors that stands in Arizona. Take a breath and take that in. That's what's happening right now, is they so want to win elections that they're willing to abandon these children and justice for these children. You, you, it'd, be, it'd be right to ask, um, how do you sleep at night? How do you sleep at night saying one thing with your mouth and then working against justice for these children. So just, I want you to think about this because this is true. The person who convinced the legislators to decriminalize abortion for women was not a pro-choicer. It was not a leftist. It was not a liberal. It was a pro-life leader in Arizona. She took that law off the books and she convinced the legislators to do what they did. 
So it was the pro-life people that actually decriminalized abortion for women in Arizona. And are you ready for this? Right now. And we've got about a week right before they go back into this. Yeah. So what happened yesterday is, you know, we have a legislator and a representative and he was giving us play by play. He was literally sending us videos of stuff happening on the floor. And it looked like they were going to do something yesterday. Thank God they didn't have enough votes. Um, and so the Republicans uh, voted um, to push it back a week. So we have till next Wednesday. They're going to try it again. Um, so all the Republicans, again, I, I don't know why. I'm thankful. I don't know why they voted to adjourn till next week, except one uh, representative Gress, who has been leading the charge. Um, what a, that? If you're in Arizona, please call Representative Gress and blow his phone up. But. He's the only Republican that voted to not wait. He wanted to get it done yesterday. Um, and here's how crazy this is. Um, we have, I believe she's the senator, uh, Shauna Bullock. Um, she's been leading the charge as well. She's been one of the main Republicans saying, this this can't happen. We got to change this. Her husband is on uh, the Arizona Supreme Court and voted to uphold the law. So what is their dinner like? Yeah, that's an awkward dinner, dinner yeah, conversation. That's how crazy this is. So you need to know that's the truth. That's the truth about the Arizona Supreme Court ruling is it was the pro-life leader here, Kathy Herod, who decriminalized abortion in Arizona for women. And it looks like it's going to be the pro-life Republicans that decriminalize it for the abortion doctor as well. Welcome to 2024. Welcome to Christless conservatism. This is where it gets you. Some people have said to us, oh, you guys are radical. You can't use the word of God. You can't call people to repentance. You can't talk about Christ. You can't talk about the Bible. You got to play it a little differently in this arena here where there's more compromise and pluralism. And and I want to say, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'll stand on the word of God. I'm not going to allow truth to stumble in the streets. I'll stand on scripture. I'll stand on the authority of Christ because that's how people's hearts and minds change. Not through this Christless conservatism and compromise. Pragmatism over principle. You're not going to get the United States of America to come to peace with Jesus Christ and a reconciled relationship with God by avoiding the conversation of sin and the word of God and repentance and faith. You're never going to get it. You're never going to get it. So these are the consequences of a Christless conservatism. It looks like in 2024, the court says, no, it's a criminal act in Arizona for the abortions to kill babies. And it looks like pro-life legislators going, well, let's decriminalize that for them. Why? Because we need votes. Mm. We can't look like radicals. Andrew. We can't look like radicals. So let's go ahead and decriminalize abortion in the state of Arizona. So listen, if abortion gets this total freedom in Arizona, it will be fundamentally and mostly because of the pro-life movement and pro-life legislators. Yep. That's fact. That's fact. Can't be disputed. That is a fact. I'll debate anybody on it. I'll debate any legislator on it. Bring them on. Let's talk. That is what we're facing. We are under God's judgment. We are under God's judgment. It's seen everywhere. It's seen across the board. It's seen from the family level all the way to the state level. It's seen in education. It's seen in sexuality. It's seen in media. Media. We are under judgment. It's seen in our laws, our legislators. When What did Calvin say? He said, when, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. Mm. And we love to think of wicked rulers like uh, Biden. And that's, there's truth to that. That's a wicked a ruler. Lot of, a lot of truth to that. Yeah, we like to think of wicked rulers like Nancy Pelosi. Ton of truth to that. Absolutely. Um, but you know what? Also, uh, these are wicked rulers when they say one thing with their mouths and then they do something different. Mm-hmm. Because every one of these turncoat, fraudulent, charlatan legislators is going to ask for votes from their pro-life constituency next election. I'm pro-life. I'm so pro-life. Vote for me because I'm the pro-life faith candidate. I'm yep. the faith candidate, yep. the pro-life candidate. All the while, they're the ones that decriminalize abortion in the state of Arizona. Why? Because they are cowards. They are not courageous. And it's time that we started having prophets raised up to speak the truth to these cowards and stop pandering to them. They're supposed to represent the people and uphold the law. They are whitewashed tombs. They look like Christians on the outside. They prefer about the life issue, and they are full of stinking, rotting, decaying flesh. And somebody needs to start saying it. Stop pandering to them. Start confronting them. You know, in Scripture, where you have leaders, in Scripture, leaders where God moves the leader and God changes the leader, how does he do so? 
through the prophet coming to them and pandering to them or the prophet coming to them and actually confronting them? How about the prophet coming to David and going, hey, there's a guy, he's got sheep and all this thing. And, and then David's like, oh, goodness, you should do this to them. And he goes, yeah, you're the man. That's you. That's you. He confronts him. And how does David, the king, repent? Because he has a prophet that comes to him and tells him the truth. And so that's what we need. We need more prophets coming to tell the truth. Um, we're not going to get to Doug's thing. Let's just, we got to do Carrie. Oh, my bad. Yes. Um, yes, 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 yes. Because okay. this, is, this is one of those dominoes like okay. from Trump. Did, do you want to talk about this one? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, Trump did his speech, and then the stuff with Supreme Court here in Arizona happened, and then Carrie. Oh, I had such high hopes for her. Carrie, Carrie Lake. <laughs> Carrie Lake. She, she's the next domino that fell, thinks that she was emboldened by Trump's speech. Um, and you, you have it pulled up and let you read it. But uh, the the part that just floored me is when she's like, I'm going to reach out to Governor Katie Hobbs. It's like the one who stole the election from you that you were suing. Now, all of a sudden, you're friends on this. Talk about talk about cowardice and turnco. That was just I was like I said, the, the level of compromise was shocking to us this this week we we've been saying this for a while that the Re republicans are compromised but it really they showed their true colors this week in arizona she says um i am the only woman and mother in this race i understand the fear anxiety and joy of pregnancy and motherhood and she's running for senator correct yeah like federal yeah not, not arizona yeah. senator okay. yeah uh, i wholeheartedly agree with president trump this is a very personal issue that should be determined by each individual state and her people I oppose today's ruling, and I'm calling on Katie Hobbs and the state legislature to come up with an immediate common sense solution that Arizonans can support. What? Carrie, you're pro-life? I've, I've been at her speeches where she was claiming to be pro-life. Yeah, you're pro-life? And you oppose today's ruling? The ruling that criminalizes an abortion doctor? So what, you want them to have the freedom to do so? In the state of Arizona, I thought you were pro-life. You see, this is, this is where the mask comes off. This is where you get the revelation of the heart. I mean, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contact Katie Hobbs. Katie Hobbs, your, your opponent, your enemy, the person that you have just vilified <laughs> through the media, and in many ways, rightfully so, shown her to be a villain. But you oppose the law that says that it's a crime for an abortionist uh, to take the life of a child in a womb. You oppose that? Brothers and sisters, I hope you're starting to see. We've been saying it for, for a long, long time, but I, I really hope that you're starting to see. Um, what we're going to do, guys, is uh, sign off for today, probably save Doug's thing till next week, just because we've been going for a long time here. Um, it, it deserves a, a yeah. much more comprehensive and full uh, engagement. Um, and we actually are hoping in the next couple of weeks to have a debate um, uh, here, right here, uh, conversation, debate, conversation, discussion uh, between myself and somebody who is, they call themselves pro-life uh, or they're supportive of the pro-life movement's uh, pursuit of ending abortion. And so we're going to have a very brotherly, uh, affectionate, uh, disagreeing conversation with each other. And so that's coming hopefully next couple of weeks. I want to encourage everybody uh, to continue to pray for us. I hope that you see now uh, the importance of a ministry like End Abortion Now. We've got bills. We've got legislators, equal protection across the country. It's happening. We need your support. Uh, we don't just need your pats on the back. We need financial support, brothers and sisters. i say it to you honestly. You can see this fight is right in front of us, and we need to overcome it. And it costs a tremendous amount of money to do what we do. Uh, but God is blessing it in tremendous ways. So if you want to give, go to endabortionnow.com. We need your help. You see what we're up against. And so join us there, endabortionnow.com. Uh, sign your church up to save lives outside of abortion clinics with us. Uh, about a thousand churches all signed up, all trained for free, given all the free resources. They're saving lives. Tens of thousands of lives have been saved through this ministry. Please give at endabortionnow.com. Let's say Zach is actually currently in Atlanta with Josh Bice. Josh Bice right and now. G3 working right now in Georgia. Thankful for you, Josh, for all your faithfulness. 
Josh is working closely, G3, with End Abortion Now for the Bill of Equal Protection in the state of Georgia. So that's happening right now. I'm heading to Kentucky next week. I'll be right outside of Louisville in Shelbyville uh, at Ref Church. I think that's, yeah, Ref Church. I think it's already sold out, though. So, sorry. Um, I think it's sold out. I think it's it's full. Uh, but that's where I'll be. That's a good problem to have, though. That's a great problem to have. So that's where I'll be. Pray for, for us. Pray for this ministry. Grateful to all of you for all of your prayers, for all your support. Uh, please share this episode. Share this episode. Don't keep it between your ears. Uh, share this episode with Christians that you know, pastors that you know. It's so vital that this, this information gets out. That's Luke the Bear. Hold on. I got to address something. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Brian, Brian in the chat. He just got me fired up. Sorry. I know we're ending this show. He's defending Charlie Kirk. Brian, trust me, brother. There's stuff coming on Charlie. We, we tried to get it last week. We didn't. Hopefully, we'll get to it next week. Um, well, let's I, just let's just say it do that. Next week will be Charlie yeah. Kirk and Doug Wilson. But he just, I told him that's incorrect. And he just said, uh, Luke, he's constantly speaking out against abortion. Where are videos of you doing that as much as him? Are you are you watching are Apologia you Studios? Are you serious? <laughs> are you watching Apologia Studios? Have you seen our whole history? Do you know about the bills that we've worked do together? Do your homework, man. Yeah, do your homework, my friend. Uh, we'll, we're going to deal with uh, Charlie Kirk. We love Charlie, but he's inconsistent in this yep. area, and we're going to let you hear it with his own words yep. um, next week. We'll just say that next week. Charlie Kirk and uh, Douglas Wilson, we'll do next week. All right, everyone. That's all. Peace out. Thank you, guys. Catch you next week. <laughs>